Hello and welcome to the video. Um, before I start, I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who's bought one of the rings or the pendants so far. Um, it really means a lot to me, so thank you very much. Um, they're selling a lot faster than I thought they would, so if you want to go and check, them, uh, check the link in the description or pin in the comments if you want to get one, because they are for a limited time, and I believe that limited time is going to be ending soon. So check out the description or pin in the comments to get yours today. Oh, they're also all solid silver and they're handmade as well, so... This case takes place in Australia, in the year 1989. I have delved into numerous cases of serial killers from down under, finding them to be some of the most chilling and disturbing cases worldwide. However, this particular case stands out, not only due to its gruesome nature, but also because of the specific demographic targeted by the perpetrator. John Wayne Glover was born to his mother Frida on the 26th of November 1932. He grew up in the heart of working class Wolverhampton, England, which at the time was known as the Black County for its dense industrial landscape dominated by iron foundries. John was raised in poverty and faced a challenging upbringing made worse by domestic disruptions caused by his mother's promiscuity, which ultimately led to his parents' divorce. By the age of 14 in 1946, John found himself drawn into a life of petty crime, committing various minor offences, including stealing clothing and women's purses. With very little prospect in his early life, John dropped out of school and enlisted in the British Army, but his criminal history soon caught up with him, and this led to an early dismissal from his national service. In 1956, John relocated to Australia and initially settled in Melbourne. Although he lacked any formal qualifications, John struggled to find stable employment, often working low-paying jobs. And soon after arriving in Australia, he faced convictions of robbery on two counts in Victoria and one theft in New South Wales. Additionally, in 1962, he was found guilty of attacking two women with each being repeatedly battered in the head and body before being shoved to the ground while John aggressively stripped them of their clothing. Fortunately, their cries for help alerted neighbours, who promptly contacted the authorities. But only months later, John would strike again. A 24-year-old woman was discovered in the front yard of somebody's home. She told the police that she was returning home from a work-related meeting at 10.30pm, when John pursued her down a dimly lit residential street, cornering her as she attempted to flee. John had beat her unconscious. She awoke in the lawn in a state of shock. She was bleeding profusely, with her garments dishevelled. Despite her screams alerting the neighbourhood, John had already fled the scene. Eyewitnesses reported seeing a young man escaping and entering a nearby yard, which finally led to the arrest of 29-year-old John Glover. John attributed his actions to emotional turmoil following a dispute with his girlfriend. After being apprehended, he was detained overnight before securing release on bail the following morning. However, as John attempted to leave the police station, he was intercepted by two investigators, keen to discuss a similar assault reported weeks earlier. Initially denying involvement, John eventually confessed to the prior incident upon further inquiry leading to him being detained again and charged. The detectives were taken aback by John's prior convictions and the extreme violence of the attacks. Despite this, he was granted a good behaviour bond and placed on three years probation. In 1968, at the age of 36, John Glover married Gay Rolls and settled in Sydney. However, the couple would then move to Mossman to live with Gay's parents. John's relationship with Gay's mother Essie became very volatile. This volatility was reportedly sparked by issues with class differences. In 1976, Frieda, John's mother, joined him in Australia, further complicating his relationships with women. He was now surrounded by two women whom he had terrible standings with, and thus a deep-seated resentment towards women developed within him. John managed to keep a lid on his hatred towards women whilst his mother and mother-in-law were alive. However, by the late 1980s, both of them had passed away, sparking the motivation of what was to come. 
Despite having a wife, children, and a job as a successful pie salesman, John began to return to his old ways of attacking women and robbery. On the 11th of January 1989, John spotted 84-year-old Margaret Hunter walking along peacefully on Hill Road in Mossman. He parked up his car and ensured there were no onlookers before punching her in the face. He then stole her expensive handbag and ran as she yelled at him. Subsequently, he took the stolen money and indulged in drinks and played poker machines at the Mossman RSL Club. The investigating officers categorized the incident as a mugging, summarizing that an opportunistic observer had noticed the elderly woman with money and seized the chance to strike. Mrs. Hunter emerged physically intact from the ordeal, albeit seriously bruised and shaken, although she was remarkably fortunate given what transpired with John Glover's subsequent victims. It was the first day of autumn, the 1st of March, 1989. Locals were going about their business in the safe and comfortable suburb of Mossman, where crime is almost non-existent. Gwendolyn Louise Mitchell Hill, an 82-year-old widow, was visiting the local shopping centre near to where she lived. At 4pm, she made her way home. Walking in the opposite direction to her was John Glover. When John spotted Gwendolyn walking towards him, he walked to his parked car, retrieved a hammer from his boot, and wrapped a cloth around the head of the hammer. John followed her to the foyer of her apartment block, and just as she reached the door, John brutally attacked her, cracking her skull and many of her ribs. John then stole her purse filled with money, and whilst he was blissfully spending it on poker machines, a group of young boys found her body. Gwendolyn was barely hanging on to life. There was a large amount of blood around her head, and initially, the young chaps assumed she had fallen over. They called for an ambulance, and Gwendolyn was taken into hospital, where it became clear that she had been horrifically attacked. Tragically, her injuries were too great, and Gwendolyn would pass away in the hospital later on. An investigation was soon launched. The police discovered that she had been robbed, but they did not suspect a link to the previous robbery of Mrs. Hunter. A forensic expert conducted the post-mortem and found several injuries to the back of the head, including a laceration and a fracture along the midline. Another aspect of the attack was that Gwendolyn's underwear and tights had been removed, and her shoes were positioned neatly next to the door. Despite the intimate nature of removing underwear, there was no evidence whatsoever of SA, which initially baffled the investigators. Investigators returned to the scene of the crime to gather evidence, but it was too late. A group of good-intentioned neighbours had washed down the crime scene, thereby inadvertently washing away any evidence. Besides a spot of blood, there was little to no forensic evidence, and no murder weapon was found. The detectives were baffled. This was a brutal crime, committed just metres away from the bustling main street in broad daylight, and adjacent a busy construction site. Two months later, on the 9th of May 1989, an 82-year-old lady named Lady Winfred Isabel Ashton was enjoying a night of lunch and bingo at the Mossman RSL Club. Following this, she walked to a nearby shopping centre before heading to her nearby home. Unbeknownst to her, she was centred in the sights of John Glover. John stalked her while she walked down her driveway. All was calm in the life of Lady Ashton, until her sinister stalker was overcome with a bloodlustful rage. Lady Ashton was violently attacked, with her head being bashed against the concrete floor several times. She struggled for her life, leaving a gruesome crime scene behind. She was eventually found in the bin room. Her underwear and tights were removed, leaving her legs bare. This time, the tights were used as a weapon to strangle her, and her money had been stolen. The lack of an intimate motive confused and frustrated the police. Despite questioning everyone who lived in the area, no witnesses came forward to assist in identifying the offender. The news of this second murder drew media attention, highlighting the similarities with the Gwendolyn Hill case. 
In the close-knit community of Mossman, disbelief spread, as many residents struggled to accept that the perpetrator could be one of their own. The police launched an extensive search. The only lead the police had was a sighting of a person leaving the scene of Lady Ashton's murder, described as resembling an unkempt substance abuser with bad teeth. One theory arose that the culprit might be a juvenile, given the proximity of the murders to a high school. One psychologist involved in the case suggested that the perpetrator could be ex-military, with a poor relationship with women. Consequently, high school students, naval personnel and other military individuals were extensively questioned, resulting in a significant drain on police resources. Ironically, this diversion of attention proved to be advantageous for John. The elderly women in the area were understandably frightened, given the recent string of extremely violent crimes. Lady Ashton's purse was soon found in a nearby park. An onlooker saw a man leaving the purse and described him similar to how he was described before, but slightly older. While working as a pie salesman, John began preying on older women confined to their beds in nursing homes during his rounds. His first nursing home victim was 77-year-old Marjorie Mosley. He molested her on the 6th of June, 1989, less than a month after his last murder. He placed his hand under her nightgown, claiming that he was just adjusting her bedding. On the 24th of June, John visited the Caroline Chisholm Nursing Home in nearby Lane Cove. There, he discreetly raised an older woman's clothing and fondled her buttocks. He then proceeded to insert his hands down the front of another woman's nightdress, caressing her breasts. He managed to flee after another one of the terrified women began to scream. Local police investigated these instances, although they were initially deemed unrelated to the Mossman murders because the police suspected a much younger man. And in these cases of SA, he was described as older. Also, whilst he may SA some older women and kill some others, he seems not to do both at the same time. Five months would pass, and on an October afternoon, just after 4pm, 86-year-old widow Doris Cox was strolling along the footpath outside her apartment on Split Road in Mossman. On the other side of the road, John Glover was visiting the post office. John turned and spotted her walking. He rushed across towards her unnoticed to catch her up. As she turned into an alleyway, John grabbed her hair and smashed her head into the brick wall in a horrifically brutal attack. The attack was so vicious that she had little chance of survival. However, Miraculously, Doris Cox survived the onslaught and was taken to hospital with horrific injuries. Initially, it was believed that she had fallen over. By the time doctors became suspicious and informed the police, the neighbours had already washed down the crime scene, complicating evidence collection once again. The police were excited at the prospect of interviewing a potential survivor of the serial killer. But unfortunately, Doris had no recollection of the attack. She was unaware of where she was attacked, how she was attacked, and who attacked her. As it turned out, Doris actually had dementia, to the extent that when a mirror was held up to her face so she could observe her injuries, she denied that the face in the mirror was hers. Some witnesses came forward, saying that they saw a young male skateboard rider riding a skateboard down on the footpath outside this retirement village near the time of the murder. An updated sketch was produced, but again to John's benefit, as the profile was incorrect. This goes to show how witness sightings alone are not enough. By this point, the pressure on the police was mounting, and John Glover's confidence was only growing, making for a very dangerous time for the Mossman community. Several days later, in Lane Cove, Sydney, a few kilometres from Mossman, John Glover was fated to meet his next victim. A 78-year-old woman named Dorothy Binky was walking down the main street of Lane Cove when she was approached by a seemingly very nice and polite man, John Glover. John offered to help her carry her shopping bag and they both made their way to Dorothy's house. Dorothy was pleased with John's kindness and so she offered to repay his favours with a warm beverage. Amazingly, John declined, 
It looked as though John had a moment of consideration for his actions and may have turned over a new leaf. However, this did not last very long. In fact, it didn't even last an hour. Soon enough, John Glover returned to the hunt. As he retraced his steps back to the main street in Lane Cove, he passed Margaret Powden, an 85-year-old widow. Margaret was totally unaware of his presence as she turned on an alleyway towards her home. John followed closely behind. He then pulled out his cloth-covered hammer and brutally attacked Margaret. Sticking to the same script, he then removed her tights and underwear again and placed her walking stick neatly at the side of her body, leaving her alone on the ground, fighting for her life. This audacious act occurred in full view of an adjacent retirement village and a nearby school. Yet shockingly, nobody witnessed anything. Margaret was later discovered by a schoolgirl on her way home from the local shop. At first, the girl approached with curiosity, mistaking Margaret for a pile of rags, until she realised that blood was pooling from the injured head of Margaret as she lay face down. Shocked, the girl ran straight to her mother in the nearby apartment, who then rushed to the scene. The woman checked for breathing and then called an ambulance. Although Margaret was still alive when she was found, she was pronounced dead shortly after by medical services. Despite repeated warnings not to wash down the scenes where elderly people may have quote-unquote fallen, neighbours soon washed down the crime scene for the third time, removing potential forensic evidence. With the body count of elderly women now totaling three dead and one survivor in seven months, all victims bludgeoned and bashed in broad daylight, the tabloids gave the killer a name, the Granny Killer, and the name stuck. On the 3rd of November 1989, at a retirement village in Belrose, John Glover continued his killing spree. 81-year-old Olive Cleveland was sitting on a bench enjoying the distant ocean views when her tranquility was disrupted by an unwelcome stranger. John forcibly escorted her down a set of steps and bludgeoned her with his hammer before proceeding to pull up her dress and this time using her tights to strangle her so viciously that the fabrics embedded itself in her neck. After rifling through her handbag, he placed it beside her with her shoes and walking stick. Olive's body would soon be found and was transferred to a small in-house morgue. The police were soon on the scene, only to find another crime scene that had been meticulously cleaned. These abhorrent murders were unfolding without a trace of the perpetrator, leaving the investigators perplexed. And why were these heinous acts going unnoticed by the community? Surely someone must have witnessed something. Detective Ron Milton recognised a pattern, the use of tights to strangle the victim. This method to him symbolises the offender's desire to sexually humiliate the victims while expressing his brutality. The excessive violence employed suggests that the killer's motive extended beyond mere homicide. There was a disturbing blend of sexual deviance and the need to degrade. Moreover, the neatness with which the crimes were executed hinted at a perpetrator with military training. But the fact that all of the victims were elderly complicated the profile, suggesting a deeper motive. There were more questions than answers, but the police were getting closer. The investigators needed answers quickly, so they created an official task force of hand-picked detectives increasing the number to 70 working on the case. Also, a reward was offered for information leading to the arrest of the murderer, $200,000. A sickening and truly twisted piece of information regarding the case was that John Glover would sit at home and watch the news, making fun of the police. He was laughing at the cleanups that followed his killings whilst his own family were in the room. He had insights into what the police were thinking at all times through the intense media coverage of the killings. The granny killer was on a roll and he wanted nothing more than to add an extra tally to his list of serial killings. 
The fifth victim was a sharp-minded 92-year-old woman named Muriel Beryl Falcona. Mrs. Falcona was a very strong-willed and fiercely independent elderly woman who owned a very large Federation-style house down Muston Street, Mossman. On Thursday, November the 23rd, 1989, Muriel was walking home back from shopping. Little did she know that John had cast his murderous eyes upon her and began his stalking. John swiftly walked back to his car to retrieve his hammer and he caught up with Muriel. And just as she entered the sanctuary of her home, John hit her with his hammer in the back of the head. When she attempted to get up from the floor, John hit her a second time. On the third strike, there was no sign of struggle or an attempt to get up. The theory is that Muriel may have been making noise, so with one final third blow, John murdered Muriel Falcona. He then proceeded to degrade the poor lady. John strangled her with her tights and stole her money. John then left the crime scene. Muriel's body was found and reported to the police. One of her neighbours had noticed that her meals on wheels was left outside. This was very unlike Muriel, so the neighbour went inside her home to go and check on her. As she made her way inside the house, she found Muriel dead with blood absolutely everywhere. But luckily for once, John had left an intact crime scene littered with blood-stained footprints. Investigators were soon on the scene. Plaster casts were made of the footprints, as well as other footprints in the nearby mud surrounding the house. Despite wanting to keep the evidence of footprints under wraps from the media, it wasn't long before the news outlets were showing the police investigating the footprints surrounding the scene. John smiled in his armchair, as he knew they were also taking plaster casts in areas that he did not go. A door-to-door -door questioning of the area yielded no results, leaving investigators to speculate whether the killer is so unremarkable that he simply just blends into the community, an unsettling thought for the people now gripped by fear. Following the Falcona murder, a surge of information swelled the suspect list to 740 individuals. Meanwhile, Detective Sergeant Paul Tuxford, an old-fashioned investigator with a keen analytical mind, pawed over every police running sheet, searching for overlooked angles or leads. He decided to go and revisit Muriel's neighbour, Maggie Hughes. Maggie was the one who had found her dead, and she revealed to him some previously unreported information. A sighting of a grey-haired, middle-aged man in a silver suit on the afternoon of the murder. This revelation sparks intrigue, prompting Tuxford to consider how convenient would it be for the killer to blend in with the elderly residents of Mossman, gaining their trust before committing his heinous acts. Detective Sergeant Paul Tuxford then instructed the task force's computer expert to comb through crime reports from the Lower North Shore in the past six months, specifically flagging incidents involving a grey-haired man. Within minutes, a pattern emerged. Six reports detailing assaults of women of similar age to Falcona and the other victims involving theft and violence. In the beginning of the video, I mentioned that John had attacked and stole from an elderly woman named Mrs. Hunter. Well, she was tracked down, and she gave a detailed description of her attacker. And she gave a detailed description, a grey-haired, middle-aged man. In early 1990, the government escalated the Granny Killer Award to a quarter of a million dollars. On the 11th of January 1990 at Greenwich Hospital, John entered the room of an elderly patient named Daisy Roberts and he pretended to be a doctor. John placed his hands between Daisy's legs and touched her inappropriately, stating that he was there to check her temperature. Daisy later rightfully raised her concerns, but she was denied as the nurse explained the doctor did not visit her that night and that she must be mistaken. However, a different nurse decided to take action. She contacted the police to report an indecent assault complaint as it just didn't sit right with her. A young constable was dispatched to investigate. 
He discovered that a grey-haired pie salesman named John Wayne Glover had visited the hospital. John then became a suspect in this assault and he was questioned by the police. Later that night, John consumed a large amount of whiskey and sleeping pills in an attempt to take his own life. John was quickly hospitalized, but he had left behind a note. His note was mostly the ramblings of a drunken man, but it also contained a chilling phrase, no more grannies. In addition to this, the woman who had been inappropriately touched by John positively ID'd him after the police were able to get a photograph of him at the hospital. However, due to a series of oversights, the note went overlooked for weeks. But soon enough, the young officer who took the photograph realised its potential relevance to the granny killer murders, and the pieces began to fall into place. In this period, John Glover was released from the hospital and returned to his normal life. He told those around him that the accusations were too much to handle. But the police were onto him. They surveilled him acutely and placed a tracker on his vehicle. On the 19th of March 1990, under police supervision, John made his way over to a woman's home, 60-year-old Joan Sinclair. The two had what John would later describe as a platonic relationship. The police followed him all the way there and watched as Joan let John inside her home at 10am. The police observed the premises but they noticed no suspicious activity. As time passed, all the team could do was monitor the situation from a distance. Seven hours passed with concern growing. Joan owned dogs, and these dogs could be heard inside the home barking. Police then got permission to knock on the door, under the guise of a noise complaint. But there was no response. When they looked through a window, they saw what appeared to be a human body lying on the ground, right next to a hammer. Once the police got inside, they found Joan dead in the hallway, with evidence indicating John's presence. John Sinclair had been brutally murdered in the same fashion as the previous murders, with blood spatters everywhere and left on the floor having been strangled by her tights. The search continued cautiously until they found John alive but unconscious in the bathtub. They confirmed he was still breathing, prompting immediate action. He had swallowed a large amount of pills and downed a bottle of scotch and laid in the bathtub waiting to die. The police were conflicted with differing emotions, but one thing was clear. They had their man, and they had to keep him alive so that he could go to trial and be punished for his crimes. John Glover was able to be saved and found himself in front of a judge and jury. John pleaded not guilty on the grounds of diminished responsibility. After coming round from his attempt, John took the investigators around the previous crime scenes and gave detailed explanations on his crimes and how he committed them. Mental health professionals believe that he had carried out these sickening acts due to his deep-seated hatred for his mother and his mother-in-law, and due to an addiction to gambling machines, as after every murder, he would steal their money and go and spend it in these machines. What you may find surprising is that John was ruled as sane, but the jury's swift deliberation ended with John Wayne Glover being pronounced guilty of all charges, including the six murders, making him one of Australia's most prolific killers. A father, a husband, and now a convicted murderer, he received a life sentence with no possibility of parole, forever labelled as the granny killer. However, despite the resolution of John's reign of terror, Detectives remain convinced that he had committed even more murders. The police suspect that John may have attacked and killed seven other elderly women, four in Victoria and three others in New South Wales. With the granny killer incarcerated, one might assume the nightmare had ended. However, John had one final move to make. On Friday the 9th of September 2005, he took his own life by hanging himself in prison, shocking many of those around him. 
Despite his declining health, his sudden death caught everyone off guard and would be seen as a final blow to the families of those he murdered. Now, it is well known that John Glover likely killed more people, and it could be possible that he left behind a sinister clue. Before taking his own life, John gave a visitor a hand-drawn sketch. In this sketch can be seen the number 9. Some have dubbed this the Confession Sketch, and believe that John was trying to play a game with investigators, letting them know that he is guilty of a further nine gruesome unsolved murders. 